Hi, everybody. I'm Graham Newell, and I'm delighted to be with you here today. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the strange stuff that I do for a living. So I'm a behavioral finance researcher. What I do is I take people, I throw them into brain scanners, and then I study specifically how they make financial decisions. So we put people in things like MRIs, and then we'll ask them questions about how do you spend money and make management decisions. I can look right inside people's brains, and what we can see is the specific parts of their brain that light up at the very moment when they're making any kind of a decision. Now we use technology like EEG headsets to measure uh, brain stimulation levels. We strap things like galvanic skin response receptors to their fingertips. We use things like eye tracking glasses so we can see exactly what people are looking at when they're making any kind of a decision. We can put marketing materials in front of them or proposals, even speeches we've done. So I've spent the last 10 years just being every person in marketing's worst nightmare because what we can do is we can look look at the stuff that they're creating, whether it's marketing materials, whether it is uh, presentations, and we can tell before they do it whether it's probably going to work. So what's neat is we've been able to save people millions of dollars in creating all this great content that we can pretty much tell it isn't going to work. We use technologies like facial coding, and we can take and look at all the little little things that happens in your face, maybe your eyebrows go up or your mouth twitches. Well, that goes right to our brain and that tells us something about how you're feeling and emotions. So what's great is now we can look inside your brain and find out the specific way that people make decisions. So I've spent a career finding out exactly how people make impulsive decisions that get them in trouble and specific ways that they can get back on track and make better decisions. Our brain is definitely wired to make decisions on an instinctual level, and I show people how to resist that. So, Jonathan, it's great to be here today. Graham, it's lovely having you here. And as I was listening to that, I was thinking, I am one of those people who makes those impulsive, instinctive decisions. So I think um, what you're talking about is so fascinating to our listeners. Uh, and certainly many of the CEOs and their teams that work with, I can think of a few that I need to introduce you to. So I'll do that afterwards. But Graham, let's take us back to, uh, that's what you're doing right now, but take us back to early childhood. How did the journey get you from there to what you're doing now? Who shaped you? Who influenced you on the way to do this kind of work? Tell us a bit more about Oh, that. goodness. It, Jonathan, it was a circuitous journey traveling all over. I'm a Canadian and I uh, was born in, in Toronto. But uh, I actually started my career as a television producer. And what I did was work for companies like CNN and CNBC. Um, I was a, a management consultant and helping them. My specialty was taking people that would make any kind of material, like a program or a show or a promo or whatever it was. And if they watched for 10 minutes, I could get them to watch for 11 minutes with very specific techniques on ways to, to do storytelling. So that brought me, got me in the world of, of media. And then about uh, 20 years ago, I started uh, and created my own company, which was 602 Communications. The company specialized in media consulting. So I spent years and years testing advertising. Now, what was really crazy is I would throw people inside of these brain scanners and then I would show them things and I'd go, did you like that? And they'd look back at me and kind of go, yeah, I love that. And then we could look at their brain and we could see that you actually hated that because we could watch your eyes moving. You weren't watching it. You, you were absolutely distracted and you were brain was dead throughout the whole thing, but they wanted to believe that they liked it. And so they kind of fooled themselves into believing that that's what it is that they did. So this is what got me into brain science. It's what brought me in, into the world of neuroscience. And ever since then, I've just been fascinated with the way that we make these weird, crazy decisions, all the cognitive biases that, that we fall prey to, all the different ways that we make decisions. We think it's a rational choice. And what I've learned from peeking inside people's brains, it's exactly the opposite. Yeah. Oh, that's so fascinating. And, and in your life journey and all the things you're doing now, and you're, you're just such a natural enthusiast, you just you, you lift the room with you. I, I must congratulate you. You know, you, you've mastered what you do. You've taught me a number of tr uh, tips and techniques about how to better present uh, and, and even some of the technology. And I'm very grateful to you for that. So thank you. But if you think about your proudest moments and your darkest moments in your career and your life, what, what would you share on, on the happiest, proudest moment and what you learned from that? And also some of your darkest moments and also what you learned from that. 
You know, I, I would say some of the darkest moments for me were definitely from, from my childhood. I grew up in poverty and uh, it was really chaotic in, in, in my life. I had a, had a father that, that had a problem with alcohol. And so there was always this incredible turmoil and, and drama going on all the time. So what I learned from that, though, was that I could really take care of myself. And it's been somewhat of a double edged sword, because once you get hit with uh, kind of living in poverty, you always kind of have this fear that there'll never be enough. And for me, that's always been a, a problem that I've had in even the leadership work that I've done. I always have a tendency to over prepare. You know, I'm the guy that's going to dot every I and cross every T and make sure that it works to the detriment of, of the project. So my team is always having to say, it's good enough, leave it alone. But that's a direct result of, uh, of you know, the experience that I had as a child. But it also gave me some positive things, which is great. I learned to be incredibly self-reliant, self-sufficient. My journey as an entrepreneur really began with taking care of myself from a very young age. And that has stayed with me. I've been able to reinvent myself many times because there was so much crisis during my, my childhood that that taught me to be resilient, to bounce back and to be able to, you know, kind of get back on that horse and do it one more time. Yeah, it, it's so very interesting. And I'm sorry for what you went through um, in a, a previous uh, part of my life. Uh, one of the one of the people I was married into a family, one of the people was an alcoholic and uh, eventually died of it. Um, but the the impact on the family was massive. And we all went to Alcoholics Anonymous and learned uh, about the fact that you, you know, this is a lot of the stoic philosophy, control the controllables. You know, was it God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And, and I think that's relevant to so many things that we have. But, but thank you for sharing that because I think it is interesting and this drive for perfectionism. And one of the great questions for you and for me is always, Graham, how much is enough? You know, uh, how much is enough? And, and uh, I shared with you earlier about the tragedy of, of a week ago, my, my brother David dying age 63, only 10 weeks after being diagnosed with metastatic cancer everywhere through his whole body, his brain, the whole lot. And, and like he lived very simply on very little money, a fraction of what anybody I know lives on. And it was enough for him. But often I know so many people who, you know, one of, one of the clients said, you know, when I made my first million, you realize it's not enough. You need to make your second or your third. Like, whoa, you know, where's all this come from? So how do you know, Graham, how much is enough for you? Well, and this is something that we've had a chance to study in the world of behavioral science. When we're doing behavioral finance research, one of the things that we find is that people have a tendency, they've saved their whole life. You know, th these are great savers. It's like, you know, just years and years of 20 or 30 or 40 years of, of savings. And one of the biggest problems that people have a tendency to have is when they get to retirement and they just can't stop that. You know, that it's like there's a time to save and there's a time to spend, but they just can't do it. And so what they end up doing is tormenting themselves. They end up wanting to be back in the game. They can't retire, they can't relax, they can't find their, their joy in, in life because they've just got to have more. It becomes this incredibly dogmatic habit because we simply can't break it. So this is something for, for me as well. I've really had to work on this for me too, because I've always got this thing of, you know, this safety thing of there just won't be enough and you've got to make sure that, that you can have enough. But I've really been able to do some behavioral change stuff using some of the professional skills that, that I have that just kind of back me off. And I'm getting a chance to do more of these wonderful passion projects that I never got a chance to do before. And that's been really fun. You know, I, I don't have as much of a making payroll that I have to do anymore. I got a smaller staff now and I've been able to relax a little bit more and have a little bit more fun. That stuff's been mainly around financial literacy for me. And it's been so soul fulfilling. It's been wonderful. Well, it's really interesting. Separate to this, we need to have a chat about my wife's charity, the Inspiring Leadership Trust, which is helping vulnerable girls uh, moment in South Africa, uh, throughout the UK, in Ireland. And, and really giving them a, a second chance when they've been through abuse and modern day slavery and trafficking. But I think there's something that we can talk about. Maybe in, you could give a, a talk to them or one of your amazing presentations. But hold that thought, because I, I think this is part of the give back. I mean, as, as someone said, remember when you succeed, remember to send the elevator back down. 
for others. And I think a man like yourself, with all the skills you've learned, it's so nice to hear that you've got this ability to, to pay it forward um, and help other people. You know, I don't make any money from these videos. It's my way of paying it forward to other people, but getting inspiring speakers like you, who other people have found inspiring, you were recommended um, by, I think it's Stan Phelps, wasn't it? Who said, you know, this is the man, have this guy, he's really inspiring. <laughs> so it's nice to have that recommendation. Thinking back to the young you, coping with that chaos that was going on, which often happens in families where there's an alcoholic parent. Um, what bit of advice, if you went back in a time machine to visit the young Graham Newell, age 16, knowing all that you know now, all the research you've done about neuroscience and, and uh, behavioral finance research, what bit of advice would you give to yourself to say, this is important and don't worry about that? What would you say to yourself? You know, the best advice that I think I got was uh, from a, a buddy of mine and things were going bad. You know, we, we weren't doing very well. And I was like going, oh, I hope, just hope I'm going to make it. And if I can, you know, I don't know if I can get a job or go to college or things like that. And, and I just wasn't sure that that was ever going to happen for me. And he looked me in the eye and he said, he said, Graham, you understand that you can't mess it up even if you try. And I said, what do you mean? I can't mess up even if I try. He said, whether you're rich or famous or go to college or what, whatever, there's a spirit inside of you that's not going to be stopped. And he said, how it actually augments itself, where it goes, how it presents itself is going to be a fascinating journey, whether it's path A, path B, or path C. So relax, because you're going to find the lessons that you need to learn. You're going to live a wonderful fun, adventurous, joyous life. And if you can just give up the need to predetermine how that's going to go, you're going to be so much happier. Mm. Oh, what great advice. And, and that reminds me of almost what they described as teachable moments. I, I used to be frightened of failing, that fear of failure that so many of us have. But now, all the best experiences I've had have been through failures I've had. Not the best, I mean, some of them have been successes too. I won the Cyprus double mountain marathon. That wasn't a success, that was a failure and it was great. But I made lots of blunders, even the failure of my first marriage. But I've learned so much from those. As someone once said, I learned so much from my failures. I think I'll go and make some more. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> but, but what great advice, what great advice, I love that. Let's go around the Inspiring Leadership Compass as a general guide to us. And we'll begin with moral quotient. I mean, there you are, you're in financial services. There's so many people in financial services who have a bad rap, whether it be greedy Goldman Sachs bankers wanting their Ferrari and selling mortgage-backed securities that are completely fictitious, um, or synthetic, uh, I think is the word beautifully. Um, or, or, or people who are door-to-door -door salesmen selling something that doesn't exist or preying on the vulnerable. Um, what, what about you, your moral quotient, your, your true north, your foundational values, that, the top three that you hold important? And, and what have you done when you, you drift off your, your true north and how do you bring it back on? You know, it's, it is interesting because I have a lot of people that, you know, come to me and kind of go like, how can you work with some of these, you know, exploitive companies like this? And what it's actually those shenanigans that got me into it, you know, because I was like, that is, is not right. I'm, I'm a big reader and I, I've done so much reading over the course of the years. And what I found was the people in the world who tend to do the best are, are the people who get an opportunity to participate in global economies. You know, you, if you want to uplift a, a nation, don't just give them money. If you want to uplift a nation, let them get in the market because that is the opportunity for the world to really come to their door, to participate, to allow them to bank, to allow them to have money, to go to a, a poor underdeveloped nation and use you know, technology like M-Pesa and things like that. It absolutely changes an entire nation. Children don't starve, families start businesses, kids get to go to college. And so I found this so incredibly invigorating that I decided that that's where I wanted to be, was right in the center of that. So many people see making money and capitalism as exploitive, and I see it as an opportunity to uplift the world, 
to get all people to be able to come together and to participate in this economy, we can eliminate poverty. We can get rid of starvation and we can get rid of disease, all of these things when people can participate in markets. And that's what I want to help them do. Mm. And whether you're rich or poor or mid, you know, middle class or whatever, it's crazy how bad people make money decisions. The very richest, the best business professionals, the people that they're top of their game, the CEOs, when you look at their finances, oftentimes they are in tatters. They can run a company, but their own finances are something that are often beyond them. Mm. And so I feel like this is an opportunity for me to give to help people to understand how they make decisions. And that really inspires me. It really mm. does. Mm. Well, th that in a way leads to the next element of the compass, the, the PQ, what, what gives your life meaning and purpose, your dharma, your calling, your vocation. Um, anything you want to add about that? Because in a way, you've taken your moral value set and you've linked it very nicely to what gives your life meaning, but why you do what you do. Is there anything else you'd like to add on that? You know, the, the big thing for me is I'm just such a big lover of collaboration. You know, whenever things go bad for me, I'm always out there, you know, finding people and bringing them back and getting the feedback and things like that, because that is what absolutely feeds me. I love the opportunity to present on stage because I get a chance to meet the smartest, coolest people in the whole world. And they'll come up and talk to you, which, which is just fantastic. So I'm a big, big fan of this sense of, of community and what a team of people can actually do. And that's really at the core of everything that I do. This Zoom technology that we're using, and I've got a streaming studio and things like that. I've been able to reach out to people all over the world. And it's just been so fantastic to get a chance to have all these different cultures come together. So one of those big tenets for me is that ability to build that tribe. And I want to build an international tribe is what I want to do, because I find everybody so incredibly fascinating. I just love listening to all these stories. And with the brain science knowledge that I have, it's fascinating to see the cognitive biases that people fall for at various nations and at various times and you know when they're having crises and when things are going well. It's just an amazing thing to watch. Oh, uh, it's so exciting. There's so many things I want to ask you about. Sadly, my, my late mother-in-law died in August last year, um, as well as having heart disease, lung disease, getting over cancer, she had Alzheimer's. And, and I've been very interested in sort of books around sleep and um, beta amyloid, this, this uh, to toxic sort of protein that builds up. But on the next topic, which is health, mental health, physical health and well-being, what couple of tips would you give to me and to others who want to look after our brain health? Because, you know, my, my late brother who died last week, you know, he had a tumor in the back of his brain, which had grown from the, the spread of it. It broken the brain, the brain body barrier, it gone into the brain. Um, what, what advice would you give about looking after our brain and our brain health as much as anything else? Well, we've all heard, you know, the, the standard things that you need to exercise and you need to eat right and things like that. No question, those are important. But I think if you look, there's a third area that a lot of people end up neglecting that is one of the big, huge things that people neglect, and that is sleep. Hmm. What they're finding is uh, lack of sleep is the new smoking, because, you know, everyone says, yeah, I'm fine. I, I can do this without rest. Your brain is absolutely stunted when it does not get enough sleep. It's a great book. Uh, one of my favorites that you might want to look up. It's called Why We Sleep. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, by, love that book. <laughs> um, what's the guy who does it? Why We Sleep. Um, Matthew Walker. Matthew. Walker. Yes. Matthew Walker. Yeah. Great book. Talks about, you know, the, inc it's like being drunk, you know, for the whole day when, when you don't get enough sleep. So, what I encourage people to do is you've got to make sure you get in bed and you get that rest and you nap or do whatever it, it takes, particularly for young parents or people climbing the, the ladder right now. We have this stoic idea that, you know, we're going to be able to just muscle it through. I don't care how macho you are. It doesn't work. Everybody gets stunted when you don't sleep. So I think that's one of the health things for, for me. Mm. The other thing that I'm, I'm a really big, um, exercise guy. And I've been able to change a lot of my behaviors by using behavioral science. 
you know, really making it a pleasurable experience. And I do that with, I'm a big reader. And so I save special books just for the time that I work out. And so it's not about, hey, I got to work out. It's now about, oh, I get to finish my book. <laughs> and so for all of those things that we take care of our health and eating and stuff like that, you've got to make sure you give yourself rewards. If it's suffering, you won't do it. You know, mm. it's a great book called Tiny Habits by okay. BJ Fogg. That you might want to take take a look at. He has a you know great little behavioral change things that'll help us do the things that'll keep us healthy, that'll keep us sharp, that'll help make our careers better, make us better fathers, better mothers, and it's a great practical guide on how to do that. I love it, and and Matthew Walker's book and everything else. I know that for example, the last couple of days, um, I, I had only like six and a half hours sleep. Whereas the day before I had eight and a half hours sleep. I'm not talking about time in bed. I'm talking about actual sleep because I record it all, you know, with devices and stuff. And, and I just find I'm, it, it, Matthew talks about 30% less performance for those two days. And I, I just know I was slightly grumpier. I couldn't think so well. I was, when I was coaching someone, I was slightly not quite as alert, but when I've had enough sleep, boy, I'm bam. And to make up for that, I always have the power nap round about one o'clock. 25 minutes, no more. I listen to um, Calm, one of the, the, the mindfulness ones, and, and I can't get through more than about three minutes. And bam, I'm gone. Deep sleep for 25 minutes. And it's like, gives me two days. Uh, have you, are you a, a, a napper, a power napper? Oh, Jonathan, I am a power napper of the highest order. Let me tell <laughs> you, man, I, I can bang out for you know 10 or 15 minutes. Now, there's some people that can do that. I, I imagine you're probably somebody that can fall asleep very quickly, right? Yeah. 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 So, so am I. There's some people it takes an hour for them to, to wind down, but what the brain research shows us is that even if you just lay down, close your eyes and do nothing, it has a powerful recuperative effort. Even if you just sit in your office and lay your head down on your desk for, for 10 minutes, it really makes a, a huge difference. So yeah, I'm a big fan of napping. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. No, uh, it, it's so interesting. And of course, whether it's Margaret Thatcher or Ronnie Reagan, they prided themselves, as you said, the machismo of, I only need four hours sleep a night, five hours. Sleep. Well, they both got Alzheimer's, uh, early onset Alzheimer's, which, which both finished them off. Yeah. And I do think we, the research is still very interesting in this area, but the, it's almost this idea of the car wash that doesn't finish cleaning out all the clag. And so you're left with this plaque, not on your teeth, but on your brain, which is there the next day. Um, I, I definitely noticed it. And, and thinking back to my time in the military when we do escape and evasion and we do resistance to interrogation, people are against the wall or the hands on the head and, and they, they were put through stress positions and lack of sleep. They couldn't think well at all. I mean, literally couldn't think well. And, and doing selection like the Navy SEALs and the Green Berets and things like that. And they go, oh yeah, we, we just keep them working for two weeks and they have no sleep. No wonder the guys, you know, fall over and stuff. Is that really the sensible way? But of course, wartime isn't kind to you. Wartime doesn't go, hey guys, look, you know, we've been attacking each other for, for a while. Go and have eight hours sleep. <laughs> we'll meet in the morning. We'll attack each other then. But, we'll um, have a nice breakfast. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah take, take it out. A cup of tea. You're English. Have a cup of tea. Take a tea. Yeah. Um, lovely. Um, uh, health question. EQ is the next one I'm really interested in. Emotional and social intelligence. And also uh, from your study of behavior, uh, and behavioral science, you know, what is it that we can learn about, because uh, it's almost like a language, emotional and social intelligence to read and uh, read your own emotions and manage them because you can't control them. Me to read your emotions and manage yours and in a meeting or on a video with lots of different people, how I'm watching different people and their faces and micro cues that you talk about. And then to pick up that, what the Germans call fingerspitzgefühl, that fingertip feel about a meeting and how's things going in our organization it's not quite right something in my gut is telling me with you know what is it 100 million neurons in there and there's there's, there's 40,000 around my heart and then there's 89 billion in my head tell me a bit about that because you, you're the you're the whiz on this Sure. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about how it is that we make a, a decision. You know, most of us have this idea that, boy, you know, I get that decision in my gut and that's what I got to go with because, you know, that that's the true me, that, that's who I am. Well, what brain science tells us is that we have two parts of our brain that make decisions. First of all, there's our conscious brain and that's the things that can do math and can decide if I'm going to go to college and can, you know, do all of those complex things. That's the part of us that we're most familiar with. But then we also have our 
our instinctual brain. This is the part of our brain that can walk upstairs and recognize friends and cry at movies and things like that. It is the part of us that just happens automatically all the time. Now, most of us have the idea that, you know, what we're about is we get hit with this instinct that can kind of drive us off course a little bit, but our conscious brain comes back in and makes sure that we always stay on course. Well, what the brain science shows is exactly the opposite is that we're primarily 85% of our decision-making process is subconscious. And so what does that, that mean? It's completely hidden from you. You're not gonna know it's there. And so when we make a decision, what happens is we feel something and that happens on our instinctual brain. And then our conscious brain affirms what we already believe. Now it feels like a rational choice, but nothing could be further from the truth. And so what exactly is that little feeling in your gut? Well, that is your instinctual brain talking. And it was optimized to make decisions out on the African savanna 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 years ago. And so the decision that you're going to make is going to be really fantastically optimized for a caveman. <laughs> But it's probably not going to be the best decision that you'll want to make, and particularly in the world that I travel in, in the world of markets. Could you imagine throwing a caveman into Wall Street or in, into the London markets? Can you imagine how incredibly freaked out they would be? So what you've got to make sure you do is feel that feeling. That's one of the big things that most people don't do. They have some feeling that comes up, I'm scared or I'm tired or I'm hungry or whatever it is. And they kind of go, no, I got to suppress that because that's a, that's a temptation that I can't, can't use. You've got to feel that feeling and kind of go, wow, I'm really scared now. Or man, I am upset and I really hate this guy across from my, my office right now. Most people try to suppress that and it ends up leaking out sideways. You acknowledge that feeling and then you make a rational choice as to what you'll do. But the big thing is feel it. Take a beat and feel it. And that's how we make better decisions. To stay with that, so interesting. Uh, some 15 years ago, I invested financial decisions in what was going to be one flat in the UK, met someone who was a very persuasive financial saleswoman from Australia who convinced me, no, don't buy there, buy in Cyprus in the sun and you can get a couple of flats and these travel companies will rent it from you and you'll make loads of money and we'll buy it off plan and boom, boom, boom. And so, you know, built it up, all this money you make. Got convinced by this, did some research, but not enough. And it sort of seemed right and got a few other friends involved as well. She was a scammer. Uh, I think some $8 million uh, or pounds she ripped off about 40 of us. And that went on for about 10 years. But not only was she a scammer, the guys in Cyprus, the the property guy was a, a, a scammer. The 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 um, bankers were the the advisors, the accountants were. You know, th th there was there was fraudsters after fraudsters, all making money on it. My gut was telling me, no, get out of here. And in fact, in the final deal, I then met a friend of mine, Craig Chislett, who said, oh, I'll help you out. And he. He introduced me to a multimillionaire who was going to buy my flats off me because I ended up with 11 flats that I couldn't sell. And, and this guy was a fraudster. He wasn't who he was at all. And my gut told me something was wrong. But I was going, no, no, you know, Craig is a friend. He will help you out. He's introduced you to someone who's going to buy it off and all the problems will go away. But my gut was going, no, no. And I was suppressing it. That is so true. And I lost $300,000. Uh, it was one of my great big errors in my life. Um, and I always, if I'd, if I'd known you then, I probably would never got involved in it in the first place. Well, and, and the remarkable thing is what, what you got to realize is it wasn't just gut versus reason. Everything was gut, okay? And your brain just sort of, you know, had your conscious brain just sort of made a couple of suggestions at the end. Mm. Almost all of our decision-making is instinctual. Mm. You know, and that's why you've got to recognize that yeah. you've got to step into it and kind of go, I am just a big ball of instinct walking around and I've got to give that instinct its due. Yeah. So so really what you're saying is feel it. Uh, trust the, the, the gut. What's the gut telling me? Because there's lots of small calculations yeah. going on, which, of course, they feed information to the brain. They're like the mini brains, aren't they? The, the, the heart and the gut. 
and, and that whole area, I'm fascinated with uh, research that you do. I'm interested in the microbiome or the holobiome, which covers the whole of your body and, and all the signals it passes from the food we have and the serotonin that's generated, which gives us the feel good factor. Uh, I think the whole thing's very interesting. So we have to feel it and understand it and then try and make some sense of it with some logic and some ab ab Absolutely. So what, what happened was, let's take your, your situation. So basically they, they hit you with this, this wonderful opportunity. What, what kicked in? Greed. Oh, I can make a million dollars. This is fantastic. This, this, this will be wonderful. Oh, tropical island paradise. That sounds wonderful. I'm going to order the extra pina coladas. You know, you had all of these things that were just hitting you on this deeply instinctual level. And so what you got to realize is that when that happens, you are now brain damaged. Okay, and your ability to make a decision is gone. So what you got to do is just like a drunk would sleep it off. You've got to sleep off your dopamine is what you got to do. You got to get it out of your brain. And the big thing is that pause. Can I pause and say, I'm really high right now on, on this and I want to go right away, but I'm going to give it a day. Yeah. And tomorrow I'm going to come back and take a look at this. That little pause allows your conscious brain to kick in and clears your brain of all those neurotransmitters that are going to lead you down a bad road. You are so right, Graham. And, and I think of another occasion when actually I did follow your advice as I look back on it now. It was one of these, they call it different things, but it's essentially um, timeshare, you know, and uh, you've won this thing and we'll take you on a holiday. And and so they sent us, we, we, we bought into this and we we didn't buy into it. We we went on this free holiday. And then after that, they were trying to do the big sale with another pitch. And I went, no, actually, I'm not. And they were so annoyed with me because I wasn't being bought into the scam. I'd had the nice holiday. That was great. But of course, it's like the the Buddhist, uh, the um, the Hare Krishna guys who give you a gift or a flower and you feel, oh, I perceive something. I need to I need to give something back. So here's here's empty the contents of my wallet. Um, and, and but in this case, they, they'd given us this holiday, we went to the experience, it was OK. But actually, no, I wasn't going to invest my life savings in a timeshare with this this company. And they were really, really bad about it. I mean, really so angry because everybody normally gets scammed and they go, oh, yes, I'll buy one and then never have it. So so that was the other side of of, of not getting too scammed. I think perhaps I've been scammed once was enough. Let's move on to the next bit of the uh, Inspired Leadership Compass because this is such an interesting cultural quotient, but also collective intelligence and, and wisdom by people when you're working with people and meetings and decisions that you make. What advice would you give uh, on, on that area of sort of how you cope with people who are different from you, how you cope with uh, you know, diversity, inclusion, equality, you know, uh, and, but yet this collective brain power and, and wisdom. What would be your advice on this one? Well, the, the big thing to realize is the people in, in our lives, we have a tendency to think that, you know, that's just sort of how they did for us, you know, the last little while, did they do me a favor, things like that. But again, our decision making is very much evolutionarily de decided. And back on the African savanna, you know, who we spent time with were our friends and family in a small little hunter gatherer tribe. When somebody else showed up that looked different or somebody that, that showed up that was from a, a different tribe, you might get killed. <laughs> and, it, and it was very, very scary to, to, to have that happen. So what you got to realize, particularly in the world of diversity and, and inclusion, particularly in, in the world when you're meeting new people, you know, this is just not something that your brain was hardwired to do. So this is a brand new skill just in the last 10,000 years. You know, fancy skills like agriculture and living in houses, that's just the last, you know, since civilization began 10, 20,000 years ago. We stink at this. Our brain has not had time to catch up evolutionarily. So what we've got to make sure we, we do is, again, give it their due and realize that when that new person comes in, I'm going to be threatened. When somebody of a different race who looks different than I do shows up, that's hardwired into our brain. And we've got to make sure that we don't succumb to it. We've got to make sure that we kick our rational brain in and say, I'm going to make a decision based on reason, not on instinct. Mm. Oh, it, it's so good. And, and what you just said there, there's um, a, a professor um, at Harvard, and his lovely quote was, we have God-like technology, medieval institutions, and Paleolithic emotions. You know, you take, yeah. your, you take your choice. It's, it's, we've still got these Paleolithic emotions, even though the technology is just like amazing, you know, electronic cars and electrical cars and, 
and you know apple watches that can tell you everything and beep at you and things like that but still i get captured by some scammer who tries to tell me pina coladas cyprus whoa mm-hmm. you, know, you could be a millionaire and, whoa i can have it yeah. yeah yeah and social media i mean just think oh. of what you know we didn't meet other people have other information or any of that kind of stuff i just wrote an, an article on how you know it just keeps us in fight or flight mode all day long yes. so you got to control your news feed We think, oh, I can get that information. I can take that bad information in and I'll be able to make a rational decision. And boy, what I can tell you from after years of putting people inside of brain scanners, you can't. That goes right in. Yeah. And you think you're immune to it, but we're not. So what you've got to do is you got to control your feed. Do what I call good news feed hygiene. Okay. Do not let those ideas into your brain. Yes. Okay. Find those trusted news sources, those people that you believe give great rational advice. And anybody that ever promises you breaking news, get rid of them. Yes. Because breaking news is, desi- is designed for fight or flight. Yeah. Uh, th- th- that is so very interesting. And um, uh, I found with the various challenges that have gone on for my family um, in, in the last couple of years, there's been a, a lot of tragedy and difficult situations that I got quite anxious and quite depressed. And um, I, I deliberately chose that I wasn't gonna look at the BBC news first thing, which is one of the things I do. So I um, turn the phone. The first thing I do when I get up, I put on the Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday. And it's got some wisdom from 2000 years ago about a good life, a good death, the decisions you make, the people you meet who try and scam you and, and, and a really healthy view on life. And that I listened to for five minutes as I'm pottering around getting my, you know, morning hydration and my supplements and things like that before I go and do my yoga or my, I, I do 20 minutes of mindfulness. I do either yoga one day, alternate days I do hit training because there's a very good book I recommend to you in return, Graham, Body by Science by a doctor, which is really saying a lot of the aerobic stuff that we always thought was so great, pretty much a waste of time. But hit training, high intensity interval training, very good, weight-based and that kind of stuff. And as I'm now 60, these are the kind of things that are really important for us and not the what they call the junk miles, which we'd run on a treadmill and really do very little. It was not a, a much better. In fact, the more I'm a long distance runner most of my life. But if I'd carried on doing that, I've stopped doing it now. I'd probably end up with lots of rheumatism and problems and joint problems and that kind of stuff, which they don't tell you about. But um, yet yeah, they, they, they suffer that later in life. Really interesting what you just talked about. Let's move on to resilience quotient, coping with adversity, setbacks and disappointments. I mean, what about your study and your research here about how we cope with setbacks and disappointments? Clearly, I think controlling the news feed that the fight or flight is good, but when something goes wrong, that's a classic time for freeze, flight or fight. Uh, What's your advice here? Well, you know, typically for most of the folks that are in our audience today, we're probably a pretty hard driving lot, pretty much most of us, you know, we're not the kind of people that get stopped when adversity happens. But this often what I find is with folks that are listening today, one of the biggest things that they fall for is something called action bias. And what is that? Well, when something goes bad, I have this predisposition to go, okay, I just need to act. And I'm so in so much pain that acting helps me feel better, even if now's not the time to act. So Jonathan, you talked about meditation. You you talked about how that's helped you to to focus, particularly after something bad like that happens. It's really important that you take that time to just feel the bad and the pain that that you're having, to acknowledge that that it's there and not to just act immediately. So again, taking that, that pause. But the people that I find are the best business leaders are the people who meditate because they get in touch with their instinctual emotions. They get in touch with what's really going on inside their brain. And it doesn't end up being misbehavior. It ends up being something where they acknowledge exactly where they're at. And now they can make a conscious decision to move forward. That's actually going to be strategic as opposed to I'm making a decision to stop my pain. They're making a decision that will take their team to the next level. You are so right. And time and again, I think the advice that I've been given and I've, I've passed on to other CEOs and leaders that have helped them the most is to stop them in this habit of busy, 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 dead, which is what goes on. And I've gone, where's the white space? Create the strategic white space. Give me a call 
and we're going to go, you're going to walk in nature, I'm going to walk in nature for an hour, we'll have strategic time to think, and I'll be interested in you talking for the first 30 minutes without me interrupting you, what do you want to think about, what are your thoughts? And, and they defrag and sort things out, and, and, and the computer brain sort of sorts it all out, and then they go, yes, great, got a whole plan, I, and I go, that's great, and, and what more, what else have you not done, and if you could live the perfect life, what would it be? All those kind of good questions. But they say that that strategic time that they haven't had before, getting them from being in the engine room, busy, busy, stoking coal, tapping the dials, checking everything, to getting up on the bridge and looking out five miles and going, Titanic, there's an iceberg five miles out, one degree to port, aye, aye, captain. Nothing happens, you know. That's what they're paid to make decisions, but they think they've got to be super busy like they were when they first started off as an analyst or whatever in the bottom of McKinsey or whatever Goldman Sachs they're in. But actually they're paid to think not to be busy, but they're not thinking. Is that not what you found in your research? Absolutely. And how many executives have actually built that time into their day? Most of the time, what it becomes about is, you know, I'll get to it if I get some extra time. Well, you're never going to get extra time. Nobody is. You've got to build it in in a regular schedule. So if you want to make this kind of behavioral change, what you've got to do is set the time aside on a regular basis. And then if you decide to cancel it, you can. But don't say, yeah, I'm going to work out three times a week and I'll work it into the schedule. Set it up to say, I'm going to work out seven days a week. With, I'm going to set time aside for seven days a week to work out. And I've got to make at least three of those. Now, you can cancel it if, if you want, but that's in your schedule every single day. And whether it's quiet time or exercise or a lunch with colleagues or time with your family, if you don't schedule it, it doesn't happen. And you've got to make sure that you put those priorities first, because those are what going to allow you to be a great leader. And so many people are so proud of how busy they are. They come into the office and say, yeah, I work 16 hours, you know, good for me. And what you did was you just fried yourself. Yeah, uh, it's it's so important to you. And I'm I suppose quite a strongly disciplined person. I think I've found that the research I did, Atomic Habits, uh, J James Cleal is a very good book. I, I recommend in return this idea of habit stacking, you know, a good habit on top of another good habit. So, so little things like I, uh, this morning, I put my, my training kit for the gym right beside the bed. So I just feet came out of the bed. There were my trainers, my, my shorts. And, and it's literally, I didn't have to get off the bed. I just pulled them on, pulled the top on, and the, put the chest strap on, which is going to measure my heart rate, went downstairs and my daughter who's staying with me, she and I trained together or my wife and I might train together. But the other thing- Jonathan, that, would you, do you have something that you give yourself as a reward for that workout each day? Sounds like you get a yeah. chance to spend time with your daughter, which is wonderful. Yeah, yeah But do. do you have a regular reward that you get for that? Yeah, yeah, I do. And, and it, it's what a lovely it? way of doing it. So, so for me, uh, the reward might be, uh, I like certain smoothies with protein powder in. That's really, I've done all the workout. Now I'm going to rebuild my body. That's great. Um, I, even actually the first thing I do when I come downstairs is I have this large pint glass uh, with a, a hydration tablet and it tastes really good. And I know I'm just recharging my body from the night of, of, of um, you know, getting dehydrated. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's so important what you've just said. And, and the other thought I had was I've got a very good nutritionist, Barbara Cox. She's been on the series a couple before you do, do listen to her talk. But Barbara advises a lot of my CEO clients and, and I've taken her advice. And one of the things she got me on uh, back to our health question, Graham, was this idea of intermittent fasting. So I do um, 16 hours where I don't I don't eat and eight hours where I eat. And what's so lovely is that um, I, I find that that creates ketosis and autophagy in those final 12 to 16 hours, both of which I think you'll tell us are, are good for us, but the ketosis is something to do with the, the brain and making use of different things. I'm not quite sure quite what it is, but the autophagy is making use of old dead cells to stop me getting cancer and things like that. It's, is that something you've come across much? You know, I'm not a nutritionist and that's kind of a little bit out of my, my area. I'm very much about making money decisions. So yeah. um, it's, it's a little different than, than my specialty, but yeah, there, there's a lot of research on this right now. There really yeah. is. No, it's, it's a fascinating area. Well worth researching further. Um, the last two areas of the compass before we go into executive teams and then your book and, and your top tip. Um, people's brand, their reputation, their image, their impact. Uh, what have you found from the sort of neuroscience and on how 
um, you know, 360, what people give us feedback, how, how we get these signals and the messages about people and what we think about them, whether we trust them or not. I mean, that's a very interesting area, and particularly with the financial services. How can people be a trusted financial advisor? You know, do you, should you trust them? You know, what's, what's your gut telling you? I don't know. Tell me more about this area, perhaps. Well, one of the things when I, on personal brands, and I do a lot of work with, with people just helping them to, to kind of really hone this. So you've got, you know, the choice of whether you're going to do it half full glass or half empty glass. So, so, so for example, I, I can use that, that, that uh, for, on financial services, I can say, Jonathan, if you save money, you're going to have a great retirement and you're, you're just going to have living in Shangri-La is what you're going to be doing. Or I can look at you and kind of go, Jonathan, if you don't save, you're going to be living out of a shopping cart in downtown and it's going to be horrible for you. So you better save. So which of those actually works better? Now, what most of us love is to be that full. You're going to have this great thing is what you're going to have if you buy my, my product. Well, what in fact works better is the opposite, because what motivates us more is fear, plain and, and simple. And so when you're doing your own personal branding statement, what you've got to focus on is not the benefit that you'll bring. That's got to be in there. But what's the problem you solve? What's the pain you'll take away? Because that is the thing that we solve first. Out on the African savanna, we didn't go, well, Mr. Lion, if you don't eat me, I'm going to give you a, a great pat on the head. It's like, run, it's a lion, and that worked. And so you've got to make sure that that fear or fight or flight or that, that thing in, in your gut, it absolutely is the most powerful. What brain science shows us is we hate losing twice as much as we love winning. And so we don't play to win. We play not to lose. And so anybody that's doing a personal brand, that's what they've got to make sure they do. What really horrible, terrible, painful, expensive problem do you solve? Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting because I, I think as a, as a leadership coach and a team coach, I often talk about the benefits that they're going to get from the work. But actually, I should be talking about what is your pain point? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? What's the burning platform you're trying to deal with? Um, yeah. But I think our, as, a, as a community, most of the coaches are by naturally quite optimistic and they're trying to lift people yeah. and their spirits. But I do think without, without distorting things, you've got to be authentic and it's got to be truthful, but you, you've got to say, these are the pain points that this will solve. Uh, and that I think from what you're saying, Graham, would be more successful, am I right? Yeah. You know, so for example, what I do is I don't say I show people how to use brain science to make more money and have better investments. What I do is I use brain science to show people how to avoid costly mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And you see the difference. Yes. Yeah. And the latter works better. Yeah. No, uh, it's against our nature because we want to be positive. <laughs> no question. And we, we can have positive parts of it. But you're here to solve a problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so good. And, and from the brand and helping people to solve problems and, and get a, away from pain towards pleasure. Um, how about legacy, the final bit of the compass? You know, stewardship, making things better than you found them, taking the pain away and making people cured and healthier from toxicity into, into health. Uh, what would you like your legacy to be in, in your lifetime, Graham? You know, for me, what, what I want to do is I want to help the world to make better choices. I look at all the things that go on with bad news feeds and, you know, what we're experiencing now with COVID and people making really terrible decisions because they're afraid. My legacy is about helping them to recognize when those bad decisions are going to be coming and then how to make better decisions. And mostly for me, it's the world of financial literacy, because like I said earlier, there's nothing that I believe that can uplift a, a nation, a people, an individual family more than being able to participate in markets. And I want to show them how to do that. I, I think that's, that's a, a very worthy and a very worthwhile cause. Let's um, really quite, we've got about um, 15 minutes left. I, I'd be interested in your views on teams, you know, high performing teams from toxic teams, what, what the neuroscience is telling you about how people interact. Um, and then a, a favorite book or two of yours before we go on to 
top tips. But if you have any video clips or anything interesting you'd like to throw in as well at, at any stage in a random way, I'm always fascinated by anything you'd share. So Graham, really over to you about teams, people, behavior, anything you think you'd like to, to share as we come towards the end. Well, one of the things that it, I think it's really critical for us is when we take on these big projects at, at work where we have large teams of people that come together, you know, maybe it's a new IT system or the gigantic new product that we're bringing to market or, or you know, some big management change that, that's going on that's going to require a retooling of the entire company. What we find most of the time when we look at these, these leaders as they, they go through is they have a tendency to really get myopic and to drink their own Kool-Aid. We mm. put so much work and so much time into these, the whole team does, that we end up forgetting that it might not be as beautiful as we think. So one of the things with all of us that we need is an outside voice. Now that can be, you know, a big leadership team, you know, that comes together to begin to bring that. Do you have somebody outside the company or somebody that's designated to come in and kind of go, I'm going to tell you whether this thing is off the tracks or not. They're objective. They don't have any toil in it and they have no stake into whether it's thumbs up or thumbs down. So many projects, how many times when, you know, the project is going bad, you know, do, do they come to the employees and kind of go, well, we're over budget and uh, it's not going well. Should we kill it? And they go, no, we, but we can't kill it. Let, we can save this. Let's just spend more money and make sure that we you know, put more team on it. We're going to need a lot more resources. And lo and behold, they end up throwing good money at, after bad. So that ability to say, I failed, you know, as we say, fail fast, fail often. That ability to openly embrace our failures is a huge part of this. So you've got to have those outside voices. And not only does this apply for companies, not only does this apply for individual businesses, but this is something that I've tried to bring into my life as, as well. I think that's why guys like you are our coach. You know, that ability to throw out that idea and to have somebody that's not in the game going, that really stinks. You are really out to lunch on that. And that would be a horrible idea. For executives, we end up not being able to have that voice. So do you have a coach that helps you do that? But what I do is I've got a whole series of masterminds that I'm a part of. These are other business leaders like myself that we end up meeting probably maybe once a month. And each time the goal of each one of us in this meeting is to shoot each other down. We talk about new ideas and I get brutally honest feedback on the viability of how some very smart people think it will go. Do you have that? Are you only relying on that from your own employees, from your company, from your peers? Because you're not going to get it there. You need somebody that will give you brutally honest feedback. And whether it's a large business or an individual person or your own personal life or on your marriage or all those things, do you have a board of directors that you're bringing to your life? A board you can't afford is what I call it. And, and um, one of the things I find so useful in the work I do with uh, CEOs and their top teams is doing 360 with them. Um, 20 people taking one of our surveys and it comes back about what the, their leadership strengths are, their areas to develop, situations to bring out the best, the worst. And if there's one behavior they should work on, what is it? That's interesting. But then I have the conversations with people like this over Zoom and I gather that in as a separate report because they say much more when you talk to them about this person and and then I feed it back to them and the CEOs find it quite hard because normally they've had just hot air blown up their ass as one as my old sergeant major would tell them and and they think everything's wonderful and I actually I give them some tough messages and I've only once in 20 years been fired by a CEO and that was because I gave him these two reports the 20 people who've done it and the, the 10 interviews I've done and he didn't like what he heard and he didn't want to share it with his chairman didn't want to share it with his, his HR director, but I said, you're going to have to. And, and I was prepared to be fired to tell him the truth, but he didn't like it. And, and I was removed, but it doesn't take away from the fact that he's an awful CEO and he's leading that business towards ruin. And I said the emperor had no clothes and he didn't like being told he was naked, but it was very clear that everybody else knew he was, but they're playing this game where they don't know what to do with him or how to get rid of him. But this, this is often the truth. And the good CEOs go, do you know what? I have, I'm human, I make mistakes, I've got to unlearn things and I have got things wrong. And, and do you know what? Thank you. It's tough. I don't like hearing this, 
but you know what? I want to work on these two behaviors and I've chosen these two. They, they've got to choose them. They've got to choose the behaviors. And then they check with their, their chairman or someone seen to them, have I got the right to, you know, hit, read the report. And, and they go, yeah, it's that one, but it's also this one. And they discuss it through, but then they own it and they want to really change it. But they keep checking in with eight stakeholders, whether they've improved or not. And it's not whether I think they've improved or they think they've improved. It's whether the eight stakeholders each month have been giving them feedback and feed forward say that they've improved. And if they don't improve, according to the eight stakeholders, I don't get paid. Now, I think that's skin in the game. I like that. That's a great idea. It, you know, and, well. you know, that's the haunting thing about, you know, all of us as leaders as we go to bed. Am I kidding myself? And so mm. many of us don't have people in our lives that will help us realize if we are. Yeah, you, you've got to be the truth teller. You've got to speak truth to power. That's my job is to speak truth to power without being phased by and being prepared to be fired if I'm telling them the truth and they don't like to hear it. But I don't want to be come across as being arrogant that I, I'm a know-it-all. A lot of the time they work it out themselves. They often know it themselves. Sometimes they don't like sure. hearing it, but they know it pretty much. Um, now. Uh, as we come towards the end, Graham, uh, books, you've told, you've told us about Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg, which I'm definitely going to get. I hope there's an audio version because I'm dyslexic. So I, I, I listen, as you know. So I'm an audio book guy, too. Like, and, and that's how I do my workouts is I, it's always my audio books that I get to yeah, do. So yeah. I, I get a chance to read my books. It's fantastic. So yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm a voracious reader of this kind of stuff. I, I read about 100 nonfiction books a year. So I'm, I'm like you. I'm exactly that. About 120 a year. I, I, get, I think I'm still trying to prove to a teacher that I'm not thick who told me, you know, when I was seven that I was stupid. I couldn't do my maths. I couldn't spell. She didn't know at the time I was dyslexic. I didn't know it until I took a test quite recently. But um, so what books would you recommend? Uh, give, give us a few of the audio books that you think are, are pretty good around this area of behavior, neuroscience, that kind of stuff. Oh, and when you, when, when you asked me to get it down to just a few, it was really tough. So you usually ask for three. Can I, can I go four? You can go four. Can I, you can go four. Can I, can I go four? Yeah. That's not, so the first book that I want to recommend is actually an older book. It's probably about 10 years old. And it's a book called The Science of Fear oh. by Daniel Gardner. Um, and what it's all about is what happens when we get afraid, you know, whether it's a business project at work or whether we're going to die in a plane crash or things like that. He explains the way that our brain gets taken over by fear. And it's just incredibly mm. amazing. Mm. And I, I love this book because it really helped me to understand very specifically how much fear dominated my own life. Mm. We all think we have it under control, but fears there all day long, all the time for everybody. Yeah. Learning to recognize it and deal with it is one of the most powerful things you can do to making better decisions. Love it. I'm definitely going to get that one. Okay. What's the second one? The next one is a life-changing book for me, probably the most um, influential book that I've had uh, in my entire life. It's called Younger Next Year by Chris Crowley. I don't know that one. Um, Chris, it's a book. Um, so, you know, for all of us about nutrition and taking care of our, ourselves and exercise and stuff, we learned how to do that when we were young, you know, when we were trying to be buff and good looking. So we had Ripley abs and we, you know, we, we were going to appeal to the ladies. Well, now a lot of us are older and that method really doesn't work anymore. So what this book is about it's a kind of a body care plan for the last half of your life. How to, what should you eat? How much should you exercise? He breaks it down to three specific things that you should do. Very simple to follow. It's really motivational. And particularly if you're into the audiobook, oh, the audio reader is just fantastic on it. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's all about how you can stay healthy and keep your, your brain healthy and your body healthy for the rest of your life. The how-to guide for us older guys. Lovely. I, I will definitely get that one. And then the third? Third is Sapiens by Yuval yes. Harari. I'm sure yep. an incredibly popular book. That book really helped me to understand exactly what motivates people. It talked about how our lives as hunter-gatherers have influenced our behavior today and the specific things that we need to keep in mind in order to make better decisions. Great book. Um, I think Harari is one of our, the great minds of, of our time. Yeah, I've read that one. Loved it. Yeah. And, the and then the, four, the fourth book is called Industries of the Future oh. by, Alec, by Alex Ross, a great book that talks about, um, it's primarily kind of an economics book, 
But what it talks about is how systems work around the world. And it's an amazing insight into exactly how all of the world makes money, does well, how we all interact with each other and ways that our world economy are changing. Mm. Fascinating. Hey, these are great. I, I normally get one that uh, once in a while that I've heard, but to get uh, three I haven't heard and Sapiens, which I probably will go back to and re-listen to again uh, as an audio, but that was great. Thank you for that. Uh, and so uh, if you would just um, once again, introduce yourself, Graham, very briefly, because this will also be part of a separate two minute top tip. Introduce yourself, say what you do, and then give us the practical top tip that people can use every day that uh, you've learned about. Well, I'm Graham Newell. And you know what I specialize in is helping people to make smarter decisions in their lives. All of us can make more informed, better decisions about our families, our businesses, our money. But we've got to learn to recognize the signs that we're about to make an impulsive choice. And that's what most people don't take the time to actually do. So the top advice that I would give as we, we close up today is to realize that we are instinctual decision makers. And most of us try to fight those emotions that come up. We try, we, we feel as though if we're afraid or sad or whatever, that it's a bad sign that it shows courage or weakness. Well, if you don't feel those emotions, if you don't acknowledge them, if you don't step into them, those are gonna be the things that are gonna sabotage you. So our decisions will be made best by a two-step process, acknowledging I have these feelings and then taking that break, take that one night break. If you've got an important decision, can I defer it so that I can make sure that in, when I'm in a different state, when I'm in a different mind, that that advice is correct. Decision-making with our conscious brain is a tough thing to do, but we've got to consciously regulate the pace, the speed, and the times when we make decisions. Because if you do it when you're emotional, when you're hungry, when you're thirsty, all of those things, that's when you're most likely to trip up. You've got to make sure that the decision-making that you do has fully engaged your rational brain. And that's what most people don't do. Don't trust your gut. Brilliant. Graham, thank you very much indeed. It's been fascinating having you on the show. And I wish you every success. I know a lot of people will be wanting to get in touch with you and they can, uh, they can do so, because I think you've got a lot to share and offer, but thank you. Uh, stay, on the, stay on the line, but thank you very much for being on the show. Great to be here. Thank you so much.